we're getting ready to launch into part three of the Shape series. Series, series. We learned the very first time that God created all of us for a purpose and he made us a, sp a specific way. And so we had the spiritual gifts. But on top of that, this guy who was out in California, Rick Warren, coined the phrase shape to include some other criteria by which we can measure how we fit into the body of Christ. And I think it's very appropriate. The heart is for the H, it's our passion. So we've got our spiritual gifts, our heart. A is for abilities. So there are certain natural abilities that some of us may bring to the table. And then P is personality. We all have different styles of personality. Some fit in different places better than others. And E for experiences. All those together make our shape and we're learning that God has a specific reason for that as he places us in the body of Christ. So today we're going to learn that every part matters. What is the most important light in your home, if you could point to one? I don't have a light like this, but I sure wish I did. Because my granddaddy in Arizona used to make unusual antique and strange looking lamps out of reused material. And I love this one. This is really cool. If I had this one, it'd probably be the most important light in my house because it's made out of uh, over uh, uh, reused galvanized uh, pipe, which looks like it could have been maybe from a gas pipe or something. And they actually even had some water valves on there, some hose bibs. And then you got the old green insulators for the globes over these antique looking bulbs. It's just really cool, really unusual. So if you had a lamp like that in your house, you'd probably say, well, it's, it's that one because it's an heirloom. Or maybe it would be your elk antler chandelier because you use antlers in all of your decorating. <laughs> maybe that's your most important light in your house. Mine, however, is a little four watt bulb located about a foot off the floor right outside the bathroom so that I don't jam my big toe right into the door jam. They don't call it door jam for nothing when I get up in the middle of the night. It's an important light, four watts. But what would happen if a little nightlight could speak? What would it say? Would it say, I'm just a little nightlight, and I'm only four watts. I barely even qualify as a light. I don't belong with all of those other lights. That's what my nightlight would say. But a lot of people go through life kind of thinking like that little four watt bulb. They think, oh, my abilities or my passions or my spiritual gifts don't amount to an awful lot. I feel like a little four watt believer. And what I might have to contribute is nothing compared to those people that I see doing those wonderful things for Christ. And they have such faith and they're going around the country and they're witnessing and all this stuff. And I don't feel like that. But guess what? The Bible is going to tell us that every single part matters. And sometimes the ones that we think might be, at least by appearances, less important are actually really vital. All Jesus followers are part of the, the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to kind of camp out in 1 Corinthians this time. We were in Romans before, and I'm saving the spiritual gift of evangelism toward the very end of my message because I need to make a couple of big points with that as we sort of wrap up this section of the first three in this series called the Shape Series. Paul actually gets kind of humorous. It's almost like he's, he's kind of taking himself out into the realm of writing a children's book when he starts making this comparison about different parts of the body. He said, so what if, if you're a foot and you say, oh, I'm not a hand, so I am not a really a part of this body. And he'll say, or I'm not an eye, I'm an ear. So I'm not really a part of this body either. I mean, it sounds funny, right? You could almost expect that you'd hear some giggles from his audience if Paul was teaching this in a public place. And what would the body be like, he asks, if the whole body were made up of eyes? Well, it'd look really strange for one thing. It'd look pretty scary. I think I saw an old science fiction movie back in the 50s that looked like that. But 1 Corinthians 12, 17, what would the body be like? Would there be any hearing going on? It might be able to see really well, but it couldn't hear a thing. So you really kind of need all those. Or how about this one? What if the body were made up of ears? I kind of felt like that in seventh grade. Sometimes our ears, we have to wait for the rest of us to catch up growing. What would the body be like if the whole thing were made up of ears? Well, again, it would look really strange. You could hear really well. You could hear that steak sizzle on the grill, but you couldn't smell it. What fun would that be? I want to be able to hear it and smell it and see it and taste it. I want all of my parts of the body engaged if I'm going to eat a good steak. 
Can I get an amen to steak? Amen. All right. But in fact, 1 Corinthians 12, 18, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. There's freedom in knowing that God has made us the way he's made us and that we have a function that matters in the body of Christ, even if we don't look like that person over on the other side of the room. So it may seem weak at first glance, that little four-watt bulb, but I'm here to tell you, it is indispensable. And in fact, in one of the translations related to this passage, Paul uses that word indispensable. Parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. I can think back to some of the folks that I have known through the years that have been members of the body of Christ, where I've been able to serve or where my dad was serving as pastor and I was just a a little attendee. And I would think, you know, that person very rarely speaks out in public. Most people could walk right by them on the street and they really wouldn't call attention to themselves because they're a very shy person. But when you understand what part they played in the body, you start to understand how indispensable they really were. And my mom and dad were good at noticing that. They could pick up on that in people. They had that sixth sense. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. Isn't that good to know? We all have a specific function. I've told, I think it was last week when I said, you know, some people may say, oh, I'm just a toenail. But have you ever lost a toenail? Oh, man. And we feel a void when somebody's not here as a part of us, regardless of what part they play, because we need everybody to be a part of that body. And it hurts when they're not here. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. We all matter, and we matter to each other. Because if we're functioning the way that God intended the church to function, suddenly we start to understand it's not just hanging around with the people who are just like me that makes true community. True community is starting to hang around with people who are very different than I am, and we start to appreciate and understand our differences, and in fact, we even rely on each other's differences. I'm grateful for the differences in this body because I'm able to call on people who have a specific gift that I don't possess, and I'll say, can you help in this specific thing? And they'll say, oh, I'm glad to, because for them, it's no big deal. For me, it's like, oh, pulling teeth, trying to get this done, because I'm not gifted in that area. Aren't we glad that God makes everybody a little bit different? There's freedom and purpose in being who we are shaped to be. And if ever there was a time in our culture's history when people are longing for a sense of purpose, it's right now. Higher suicide rates than we've seen in a long time. People are hopeless. They're aimless. They need a sense of purpose. And Paul's telling us in 1 Corinthians, and God's given you a sense of purpose if you could just awaken yourself to what he has gifted you with and put those gifts to use as a part of a body of Christ. There's such purpose in that. We don't just absorb light, we shine light. I'm gonna throw a couple of different metaphors at you, both of which come from scripture. We don't just absorb light, we shine light. So if we were just absorbers, if we were sitters and soakers, we would come to church and we would get all filled up with our vitamin D, almost like you'd be sitting in front of uh, one of those lamps, you know, that's supposed to try to help you with this uh, seasonal affective disorder. So let's say that the church is a seasonal affective disorder lamp, and you all come to just soak it in, and fortunately, you've got a magnificent pastor who can just shine shine all over you. I'm just going to shine, baby. And so you go home, and you think, wow, I got my vitamin D for today. I feel great. But is that what Paul is teaching us that we should be like? No, we're not supposed to just absorb. That's why I was teasing our two snowbirds. Uh, when I sent them a text this morning and I showed that in my vehicle it said that the outside temperature was zero when I sent it to them at 7.30 this morning. And I said, oh, we really miss you. Wish you were here. Uh, We really do miss them, but they're just kind of absorbing. But that's okay because they're going to come back. And when they do, they're going to start shining a little bit too. What is this on the ceiling? Anybody get a clue? Yep, glow-in-the-dark stars. I happen to know a girl in my family who, when she was little had some of these little stickers that she would put up on her ceiling so that after they had absorbed a lot of the UV rays through the day, then you'd shut that nightlight off and we'd have our little nighttime prayer and we'd have our little song and then we'd rub that little girl's face with our finger and say, we're going to go off the ski jump now. Whee! Good thing it didn't land in your mouth. You would have eaten the skier. And we'd, you know, all the little things that you do with the kids, but she'd be looking at those little stars twinkling above her and she'd drift off lazily into slumberland. 
But those don't have any power in themselves, do they? They're reflecting the power that has been fed into them all day long. That's kind of what we are as the light of the world. The sun is the one who gives us the light, and we're just reflecting it. We absorb a little bit of it, and then we put out what little bit we can. Some of us are little four-watt bulbs. I feel in my life very often like I felt like a four-watt bulb, but I'm still supposed to, this little light, of mine, I'm still supposed to shine my little light around. We absorb the gospel light of Christ, and then we shine some of that light back into a dark world. Now, I have to define a term. Because when I used to hear the old hymns and I would hear people talking about, you know, the pulpit pounders with the Holy Spit and, and they would talk about the gospel light. <laughs> that was something that for me meant that you had to go and smash somebody up the side of the head with a big family Bible and tell them that they were going to die and go to you know where if they didn't accept Christ right now. That was what the gospel light meant to them. And when I look at the New Testament... And if I look at all the different gifts that God has given people in the New Testament and I see how people are drawn to the love of Christ, I think that was an inaccurate depiction of what shining the light means. The gospel has a permeating influence on everybody we come in contact with if Christ is truly living in our hearts and minds. And he is and he does. So that with all of us, even if we're not gifted in the same way as somebody else, we could be one of the most introverted persons on the planet, and we can have such a wonderful permeating positive effect as we shine the little four watts that God's given us into other people's lives, and it's amazing to see that happen. I watched that with my own sweet, dear little mother, and she could be so meek and still so powerful in the way she came across to the people she came in contact with. That's the permeating effect of the gospel, and that's what we're all supposed to do. Think back to those little lights on the ceiling. What happens if we, one of us was our little four-watt star, and it absorbs the light from the day, and then we go out the next day, and we're going, I'm trying to shine. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, I don't have much to shine. But what happens if we gather with a whole bunch of other stars like that, and maybe all of us are four-waters? You put enough four-waters together, and what happens? All of a sudden, it's glowing. That's why God needs all of us in the body of Christ to absorb that light from his word and then permeate that dark world with what he's got us to share as well. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Why would you do that? Because you didn't want anybody to see it, he says. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. That was Jesus' words as he was teaching about how we're supposed to shine this gospel permeating light to others so that we can reflect his goodness to other people. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. I've noticed in several of the parables that we went through when we went through our Matthew study a couple of years ago, and every time somebody would finish some wonderful miracle, or it wasn't the parables, it was the miracles that I'm thinking about, especially the, the man uh, who was paralyzed and his friends let him down through the roof. That's the one that's coming to mind currently. And then Jesus said to that man, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees were saying, who is he who's saying his sins are forgiven? Only God can do that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of the point. And then he says, and just to prove that I have the authority to forgive sins, I say to you, pick up your mat and walk. And the guy does so in the presence of everybody there. And what's the result? Everybody there praised the Father in heaven, except for the religious snobs who didn't get that he was actually God incarnate. And then here's this other one in Romans from Paul. Give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. This is important for a couple of different reasons. The Greek and Roman world had a real dichotomy between the soul and the body. And a lot of the early religions were always trying to escape the body because they thought the body is bad, the body is evil. And if you can get separated from that and just get into the spirit realm, then you'd be okay. Then you can be of some good in eternity somewhere or wherever we have to go to, find, to make the gods happy if it was in the pantheon of the Greek gods. But Paul would say it means something to us because that means that it affects all of us, including our bodies. We need to be a living and a holy sacrifice. Let me read to you what one pastor said. I was listening to a pastor out in New York City. His name is Tim Keller. And he said a couple of things that really stuck out to me. He said, some really independ independent person might say, I'm an independent person, which means that's what I'm sacrificing to. Because we all sacrifice to something. We all serve something. He says, it's just a matter of what or who we serve. He says, no, you're wrong. 
I'm totally free. I'm exercising my autonomy. This is the person who's uh, trying to be independent. He says, I'm exercising my autonomy and freedom to be a totally independent person. Nobody will dictate what or who I serve. You can't tell me who I'm going to serve. And he would say, well, if that's the case, you're going to die lonely and alone. You'll be sacrificed on the altar of your own independence. That's what happens when we replace anything for God and whatever it is that we might serve, we're going to serve something and we need to make sure that we're serving the right thing. Why not serve something that can give us infinitely more than anybody else or anything else can? What happens if we're serving, let's say, just our, um, our job? If our career means everything to us and you're pouring yourself into that career, what's that going to get you 100 years from now? You might be temporarily satisfied, you may have some benchmarks that you can reach and say, hey, I finally reached this level of management or I made this much money this year, and you can feel good about yourself for a minute, and that's about as long as it's going to last. He says, but you've got to serve something that's going to last so much longer than that. How about a person? I've seen some people invest themselves so much in a personal relationship that what happens when that person says, um, I've been thinking. I don't think I really want to continue this relationship. I'm walking. What does that do to them? Well, sometimes it devastates them. Why is that? Because they can't give you what's going to satisfy you for eternity. Only God can give you that. So that's why I think it's so vital that we catch this living sacrifice idea that Paul is teaching us here. We all want something that puts life into our lives. I'm stealing that from Jacob Elwell. He and I had coffee the other day or hot chocolate. And I don't know if he's the first to have said it or not, but I'm going to credit Jacob for saying it because it stuck with me. I thought, that's a great thing. I want something that's going to put life into my life. What can that be? And it seems like that's what Paul is trying to teach us, how we can put life into our life. We recognize that God's given us what we need to put life into our life, and it's not going to be the same if we're exercising that as one individual soul purpose or a soul person. We can't reach our full potential that way. It's only when it's in context with all these other members of the body that then things start to happen. Uh, this just popped in. I have the weird things that come into my brain sometimes. It's the ADD, I'm afraid. But somebody was talking to me a couple of years ago about this thing called alien hand syndrome. And apparently it's a psychological thing. It's a real manifestation where people would have their hands start doing things and they wouldn't mean for them to. And they would say, stop that. You know, it's like, quit. What? No, stop. You're not supposed to do that. You're in public. Is it, is it okay for me to pick my nose in church? I'm sorry about that. Fortunately, my wife is not here to correct me. But the alien hand syndrome, it seems so odd. Why is it odd? Because the body's supposed to function together in concert. You're supposed to be able to do things that actually make sense. And when somebody tries to say, oh, I could be a, a believer in God, but I don't have to be a member of that body of Christ. It's like alien hand syndrome. It's like you've got this weird part of the body that's off doing its own thing. It's like on, what's that show? The, the Adams Family? Wow, that's just weird, right? I think sometimes we need to understand that when Paul is giving us humorous illustrations, it's because he wants it to stick. He wants to be ludicrous with how ludicrous it would be for somebody to say, I love God with all my heart, but I don't really go to church. I don't really want to hang out with those people over there because I just feel like I can be more in touch with God when I'm out in his creation and stuff like that. Well, sure, we can. But man, if you read any part of the New Testament, especially these parts that we're looking at right now in the Shape series, you get to, to the conclusion that we've got to be a part of the body of Christ if we're going to truly be fulfilled. Can you tell I get a little passionate about that? It's my exhortation. It's coming out. God gives us what we need to put life into our lives. And he does that when we come in contact with people that help each other become our best selves with relation to how we're related to God, not living my best life now like we see some other people who would write about that kind of subject. Because our best life now is the one surrendered completely to Christ. Now, the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose, meaning eternity as a new creation in Christ, that's the context if you read back just a little bit before 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, is God who has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Interesting thing happened just last week we had posted the audio versions of the first couple of uh, installments on this series, and Marcia Spickenagel, who was unable to be with us in person, listened to one of those, and she calls me on the phone. She goes, Pastor, Pastor, I just have to share something with you. This is so cool. I just got to finish, finish listening to that Shape Series sermon, 
And I have this morning devotional from a book that I downloaded on my Kindle, and it's this guy who teaches one Greek word a day and unpacks that Greek word and shows different areas where this Greek word makes a difference in how you interpret the word. And she said, and one of the things that you said, it just sounded like, man, God is smacking me upside the head. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) She says, no, it's a good thing. She says, the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose, meaning that he's made us a new creation, it's the same Greek word for working out our salvation with fear and trembling. And it comes from the word that would be a creative enterprise, like you're fashioning a poem, you're creating a poem, you're rearranging something into a way that's never been seen before. Maybe you're a composer and you're rearranging notes so that there's a sound that somebody has never put in that combination before. Or maybe you're an artist and you're rearranging things on uh, an easel, on a canvas that's never been seen quite like that before. It's a creative, loving enterprise and God creatively fashions all this that we're looking at inside each of you. Isn't it great to know that the best artist in the world has fashioned you the way that you are because he loves you, new, uh, loves you enough to make you absolutely unique. I like that concept. I think it's great. And then it helps us unpack that uh, scripture. I'm going to look at two different translations to show you why it's important to compare translations when you come across something that makes you go, huh? And this is one of those. Some people read this and they'll say, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, this is Paul speaking, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And they would go, huh? I thought salvation was by grace. I thought it was through faith only that we can't work our way into heaven. How come he's showing us that we're supposed to work our salvation? It's, no, it's work out. And the word for work out is fashion. You're supposed to be creative in fashioning out these things that we can shine our little reflective light into a dark world as a result of the salvation in our lives. And look at this one translation right here. This is the New Living Translation. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, says Paul, and now that I'm away from you, physically he means, it is even more important, work hard to show the results. Aha, let me back up and say that once again. And I want you to say that word in yellow with me. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. That's very different from work for your salvation. It's not working for, it's working out, and it's so that we can show the results of our salvation. Why is that? Because he created us for these good works, which he's created us in advance to do, because he's creatively fashioned all those things within us. We're obeying God with deep reverence and fear, because we know he's fashioned us that way, and every one of you is unique. Now, Three ways that being a living sacrifice can affect every one of you. I'm going to zip through these quickly. First of all, being a living sacrifice affects all of you. Remember I said there was that dichotomy between body and spirit in the Greek and Roman world? There were some people who sort of compartmentalize their faith and say, well, this is the inner, the inner self, and that's my faith part. But I'm going to go out into the world, and I'm going to live just like the world out into the world. And Paul's saying, nope. That's not what you're supposed to do. It affects every part of you. You're going to surrender your bodies as well as your spirit because you're all one. That was mind-blowing to the Roman world, to those Greeks. They would have been going, what? This is incredible. You mean that if God transforms us, we're supposed to take our bodies with the things that God is changing us from because of the inner workings, the transforming of our minds, and we're supposed to impose this stuff lovingly on the world around us to shine that light out so that we can have a permeating effect? And he would say, yep, that's what you're supposed to do. It affects all of you. And I've known some people who've kind of had this dichotomy going on even in a modern day sense that they would say, oh yeah, I believe. I have this part of my brain that is my belief part. I believe in God. But they're doing nothing with their lives that would give some indication that they're shining any light out there. And Paul would say, Okay, if there's that kind of dichotomy, you probably need to go and revisit whether you're really truly saved or not. Because if you're truly saved, there's going to be fruit born from you. You're going to shine light out there, especially if you're hanging out with other members of the body of Christ because you spur one another on to good works. Secondly, being a living sacrifice affects how we feel about ourselves. Let me show you how in Romans 12, 3. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. In other words, don't get puffed up to say, I'm an ear. 
Too bad about you, little toe. <laughs> I'm an ear, and so I feel pretty good about myself because of the role I play in the body of Christ. I can hear really well. He says, no, don't get puffed up because we're all equal. He says, think of yourself with sober judgment, which means rationally, introspectively, honestly. Have a, a good view of yourself, an honest view of what you're really like. And he says, but that can also reflect the opposite end of that spectrum. You can think lowly of yourself. He says, don't think too highly of yourself. Be puffed up. But don't use the fact that you've got a four-watt bulb as an excuse or a cop-out to say, yeah, I can't do anything. I, I'm just going to sit here and soak in the UV rays from the sun and from the light because I can't do really anything. And so I, I think of myself so lowly that God could never use a person like me. He said, no, don't think that way either. Somewhere in the middle is a balance where we understand, yes, there's something God has for me. And I need to find what that is and plug into it so that when I do, I start to shine out this light that comes from the source, which is Jesus. Because God has distributed to each of you these different gifts. Number three, being a living sacrifice affects our attitude toward others. Suddenly, I find myself willing and a little more able to put up with annoying people more than I used to. I find myself telling myself, wait a minute, remember, you're reflecting light. This person is really annoying right now, but for 30 seconds, I'm going to love them with the love of Christ. Just 30 seconds. If I can just hang in there for 30 seconds, I'm going to do it. And then when 30 seconds gets done and they're still annoying me, I can say, okay, God, give me 30 more seconds. And he gives me 30 more seconds, and I keep loving that person because we're a servant to other people. Now, that's taking ourselves outside the realm of the spiritual gift of serving. That's different. That's just being a general servant, meaning that I'm going to be a servant to everybody I come in contact with so that they can see Christ being reflected in me. Every believer, every believer, I don't have a pulpit to pound on, so every believer has at least one ability. Some of us have more. Most of us have a mix Every believer is unique. And a beautiful thing about that is that even if you may be shaped like an ear, and even if you may be shaped like a big toe, maybe you're an elbow. Would you scratch mine right over here? That'd be great. See, there are certain things that we can do for each other when we're all put in the same thing because we're all unique. But when we all get put together, what does it look like? It starts to look like Jesus to the world. They start to see what he looks like expressed into the world a whole lot more clearly than if one person tried to just shine that light. We can't measure others by our own abilities. If I were to say, I'm going to use this ear as a measuring stick, and I'm going to hold it up next to that eye. <laughs> Poor eye. You know, you just don't measure up. It's too bad that you can't measure up to my standard of spirituality because I'm an ear. Paul is saying that that's ludicrous, and we can't do that with our spiritual gifts either. That's why I saved evangelism for the last. The special ability, this is evangelism, the special ability that God gives to certain members of the body of Christ to readily share the gospel with unbelievers. I've read different books about spiritual gifts. There's a somewhat of an academic consensus that they would say there may be upwards of around 10% of the people in any given congregation who actually possess the gift of evangelism. So if somebody says, oh, but I thought that's what we were paying the pastor to do. What happens if the other 9% of the people in that congregation possess that gift and they're not exercising their gift of evangelism? There's not a lot of light being displayed out there to the dark world. Evangelists, especially if they were given as a gift in terms of the office of evangelism, which we can also read from Paul, are there to serve the rest of the body. How is that possible? It's because people like Pastor Mike who just exudes the gift of evangelism. If you cut him, he bleeds evangelism. <laughs> he can actually train others in how to share their faith, and that's one of the things that we who have different gifts who are part of the offices, if we're shepherding, we need to teach people how to shepherd one another. If we're an evangelist, we need to teach people how to evangelize people. If we're the prophets, we need to teach people how to boldly proclaim truth to other people. That's what the people with the offices of gifts are given as a gift to the body. But all of us can be doing evangelism even if we don't have the gift. Just like all of us can be merciful to other people even though we might not have the gift of mercy showing. So I might not have it to the same degree as everybody else, but not having the merciful gift is no excuse to just be blunt and hurt everybody's feelings all the time. Yep, guess I didn't have that gift, jerk. <laughs> people are going, whoa, this, I feel like I've been run over 
you know, by a, a Mack truck every time I'm around this person. Yeah, it's because I don't have the gift of mercy. <laughs> Too bad. No, we're supposed to have the fruit of the Spirit as well so that all converges together. You see why it's important for us to hang around other people in the body? Fortunately, I have a wife. And sometimes our wives are really good at pointing out when we need to kind of take it from here down to here. And maybe we've stepped over the line a little bit, but all of us can like iron, iron sharpening iron. We can help each other as we look more and more like Christ as well. So the caution for all gifts, not just evangelism, all gifts, is not to hold up your gift next to other person's gifts as a measuring stick. It's inappropriate. It can't be done that way. What, after all, is Apollos, who's a guy with a great gift of being able to explain the word to other people? And what is Paul? Only servants, Paul writes, through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. He's basically saying, look, Some of you are really putting a lot of stock in Apollos because he is an eloquent speaker. He is so good and he's an apologist and he can unpack something and make it sound so brilliant. And then there's Paul and he's a pretty good speaker too, but he's got a different set of skills. But we're all just servants. God is the one who assigns each of us to this different task. He says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God's been making it grow. That's what happens in a body of Christ. And if all of us as little tiny four watt stars are shining our light, then all of a sudden, some of you have cultivated a friendship somewhere that none of, us else, none, none of the rest of us could cultivate. Somebody else comes along, they water that. Somebody else is watering a little bit more. And pretty soon that seed of the word that's been implanted in somebody's life, after a hundred little sacrifices, they start to say, oh, I get it. I'm germinating. I'm starting to feel that this gospel is having a permeating effect in my life, and I'm waking up to the idea that God has a life for me too. And I want to sacrifice myself, become a living sacrifice to the one person who can make my life better for eternity. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. It's the same purpose to be able to spread this redeeming gospel to as many people as possible, because I want to take as many with me as possible to heaven someday. These are some things we can do. They're simple, but we can do them together as a collective body of Christ. Cards and cookies. We're going to have a... Mike's been on me to get good deadlines. Thank you, Mike, for that. He heard something uh, on one of his trips when he was probably heading down to Florida, which I'm a little bit jealous about, but Paul tells me I'm not supposed to be jealous. But he's been saying that good leaders set deadlines. And so, man, we're working hard to set deadlines so we can get stuff done this year. And we're going to set a deadline by which we're going to be able to have these cards that you can hand out to people. We're going to have lots of opportunities for us to collectively go and serve somewhere, hand out some cookies and punch at a concert, things like that, and then just hand people the card at the right opportunity. All of us can do that. Events on the property, we're coming up with a couple of very crazy ones that might just attract some attention from the other folks. Going to see if we can... Uh, get a trebuchet that would put a pumpkin from our property into the back of the Gubini's house. <laughs> yeah, we'll have a walkie-talkie. You can let us know if our range is just about right. There. <laughs> it's the least we can do. We're going to have some question-based Bible studies. If you want to go to uh, qplace.com and look that up, I'm going to be talking more about that, and we're going to have some sign-up sheets for people that say, I want to try one of those, I want to be trained, and then I'll invite you into my home so that we'll actually do a practice session together, and then I'll also be meeting with you weekly to help you so that if you say, we ran into this problem in our study, what do we do about it? Then you've got constant feedback every week about how we're going to work that out. Maybe we'll only have one start. I'd like to see six, but that's just me. But however many God is going to raise up, it's going to be because we're gifted for that, and it's a place where we can get out right out there into people's homes and invite friends and neighbors who might not have anything to do with church. That's great. We would love for them to participate in that so that you can ask some questions. They answer the questions. The questions can be answered from the Scripture, so you don't have to be the resident expert. In fact, we recommend against a resident expert because we don't want to make people feel like, oh, I can't go to this study. I don't know enough. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to get people into God's word. So we're going to talk more about the Q-based studies and then inviting people to events and sometimes they might actually come to church. I've heard some of these testimonies about somebody that said, man, I had this annoying neighbor and I finally just said, yes, I'll go to church with you to get him off my back. It was after about the 20th invitation and I showed up and then I find out, oh, wait a minute, this pastor's been reading my mail. How come he's talking about stuff that I've been thinking about this last six months? This is weird. You know, I've heard testimonies like that. 
And then coffee chats. Just invite a neighbor out. Get to know them better. Invite them over to your own house. Take them out to the, uh, the Owl in Milan or to a nearby Starbucks. Or if you don't like that kind of coffee, just make some tea. That's okay. Whatever you like to do to invite somebody that would open them up to an hour of just talking and get to know them. You might not even get into a spiritual discussion the first six or eight or 12 times, but get to know them. Invite them into your life before you invite them to church. That's how I want us to start behaving what we believe in 2019. Are you with me? All right, thank you. Turn in those reach opportunity sheets by next Sunday. They're on the back table. I want everybody to participate. My aim is to have clearly communicated this vision so that everybody will say, I can do one thing. And you may already be doing six. And if so, tell me what the six are. We're not going to heap any more on you. Okay, we don't, we don't want to burn you out. <laughs> That's totally fine. But if you not, are not doing anything yet, there should be one thing on there that you could say, I can do that. And if there's not, mark other and tell me what that one thing is. And then let's reach together because if we have 100% of the people in this body of Christ, each with their shape, exercising what God has gifted them to do, God can do the impossible because that's what he's good at. Let's pray together. Father, I'm looking forward to seeing what unusual things you've got up your mighty sleeve this year as you're teaching us how to really become that body of Christ the way you envisioned it and the way you put it into practice way back there when Paul was instituting some of these things in the new believers. And I'm grateful that we're that kind of New Testament church that basically we just take the word at, the, at its word. We think that this stuff still happens, it still works, and you're still doing the impossible through simple four-watt believers doing what you've get, gifted them to do when we put all those parts together and work the way you intended the body of Christ to work. I pray that you'll do that this year in 2019. And I thank you for what you're going to do in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said... <laughs>